Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Episode 23, Parallels with Richard Feynman and Music Learning Theory. Okay, Eric, so I thought today on the podcast we would talk about Richard Feynman, who, not for his musical ability, I think he was a bonga player or conga player. <laughs> yeah, and these man, man <laughs> drum circles, he would really get into that. Okay, in his defense, I've never heard a recording of him playing, but uh, he said, Eric sent me an article, and I've been interested in Feynman for a long time. He's a funny guy and very smart guy, obviously. Um, by the way, Richard Feynman, Phys- the famous physicist. physicist. Yeah, he yeah. was. He worked on the on the bomb. <laughs> I believe he won a Nobel Prize, if I'm not mistaken. Do you not? What else? What else? A little background. He was on the team, led the team that discovered that the O ring on the challenger was the thing that uh, shrunk uh, when it got below temperature and that's why the fuel leaked uh when the challenger Mm -hmm. blew up uh is he's just one of the most phenomenal thinkers of our of this last century yeah someone recommended that i read his book uh surely you're joking mr Feynman. it's it's a brief story about all the pranks and jokes he's done his whole life and he seemed mainly interested in physics as an extension of his you know he had this interest in how things worked yeah the book talks about when he was a kid he would take apart these radios and and uh put them back together and i think he was one of the only people in his little town at the time that could do it really well and but he was he was always interested in how things worked and it was like a puzzle to him yeah, so we'll, some of an obsession with these types of things. So there's an intersection with music learning theory that we'll get to. Um, mm-hmm. You know, another anecdote of his is somebody was just mad, mad as hell that he couldn't just appreciate, you know, the flower. Somebody was looking at a flower and he, and he started going off about the the color, the light, size of the stamen, you know, how it photosynthesized all all these things like the inner workings and the lady or whoever man whoever it was was in conversation with why can't you just appreciate its beauty and he says it is beautiful but to me it only raises the amount of beauty in my world if you also understand that hey it it captures this bee you know that the, Mm -hmm. the light from this particular kind of bee it searches out that color and that's why this thing is you know, how did it evolve to be like that? And then he's, you know, trying to explain mm-hmm. that it be, only adds more beauty to understand its inner workings and why it evolved the way it did. And so it's just like uh, an extraordinary, uh, you know, thinker, period, and then loves nature and plays congos. Well, or- and I would say, I would say there's different kinds of aesthetic responses i mean the aesthetic response to the visual impression of your conscious experience of the flower in front of you you know you can have an you can have a uh, response to that of, of meaning and beauty but then there's another he's having he's talking about a response to this kind of um this conceptual like a meaning and understanding and of where the flower sits and yeah so you know he's enjoying that and i think this is experience. right and i think this is this is chapter one and music learning and then and learning sequences and music is appreciation and understanding and understanding with appreciation or understanding without appreciation is maybe not as much because anybody can under or can appreciate a piece of music if they like it they just say they like it and that's fine but if you don't understand it um what wouldn't understanding bring more appreciation and you know the word understanding gets thrown around a lot a lot of mod uh, a lot of modern educators you know say things like and we talked about this on the podcast we had a whole episode in the ed hirsch podcast dedicated to you know i don't want to teach the names of concepts i want to actually teach kids or whoever ha- really understand something and in a sense i profoundly agree with this and this is why we're actually talking about Feynman. we'll get into this story in a sec but in another sense this can be kind of it can be it can be a little abused to the point where people stop teaching content and they kind of just let people do whatever they want in a classroom, you know, and then that's a different 
when we talk to you, Eric, you know, you say things like I let the kids steer me in the class and I learn from them. And I believe you do, but I also still believe you have some kind of curriculum agenda. Like I'm still trying to teach content, right? You're not just, oh, you're just hoping. Yeah. So I, I just say this as a, um, a general warning in terms of I'm, I'm not, right. I'm not up for curriculum less uh, classroom. So we want to talk about Feynman because Feynman had this insight that Gordon had and i've was making the claim that a lot of people in different fields have this insight i mean even the buddha had the insight that the name of something is not the same as the thing itself i mean you know so you got philosophers and religious people and physicists and edwin gordon's talking about this and all kinds of other philosophers have talked about this but there is a huge difference between thoughts about something and the actual thing and when you say this to somebody like this, it can sound mind-numbingly stupid or juvenile, but people often forget about this. And so I'll use this story about Feynman. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this from an article off of bigthink.com. We can post the link to the article. But in a lecture given by Feynman in 1966, the, inf the influential theoretical physicist told a story about the difference between knowing the name for something and truly, under and truly understanding it. And so the article goes on to talk about how um, if you look at a bird in nature, all these different languages give different names to the bird. You know, that's a that's a finch, you know, in Mandarin it might be something else, and in, in French it has a different name. The name, though, is a label that we assign to it so we can recognize and communicate with it. But the name itself does not tell you anything about the inner workings of the bird or what it really is. It doesn't tell you that the bird can fly or that it lives in this area or that it has these behavioral proclivities. It doesn't tell you any of that stuff. And so hopefully what happens is when you learn things about the object, in this case, the bird, and then you learn the label, the label acts as a way to reinforce all the knowledge and understanding that you have. But Feynman's point here is that by just teaching someone the name, and moving on, you actually miss out on the, the real learning. And he goes on later in the article to talk about how, you know, when we teach science concepts, we often teach big concepts like energy to people that really have no business learning about a concept that's that abstract. They, they haven't even grasped how, you know, just basic sensory perception, like, well, when I turn my glass of water upside down, the thing falls down. You know, we're trying to teach them high level abstract concepts like energy that are very memory based, which is fine. Memory has to come in at some point. But the underlying mecha mechanisms for why things flow a certain way or how energy is stored, it can be very easy to leave those things out. And obviously, we're bringing this up because in music, this is like the biggest error that people make. People think that if you know the name of a scale, that's going to help you. If you know that, even know, you know the name of solfege or even know the name of tonalities. Like that's not necessarily what makes a musician a musician. It's this underlying um, uh, in real time understanding. And that's why I think audiation is best described as it's a perceptual change. So, I mean, Gordon was famous for not liking the terms inner hearing and aural perception and things like that, because there's a difference between aural perception. You know, I hear knocking on my desk but audiation is a step beyond that where the sounds have been organized. But the hallmark of when someone is learning to audiate is when they listen to the same piece of music that they may have listened to before when they were younger or in the past, their perception of it in real time is changing. They don't have to do anything. When they hear the music, it's organized in a more sophisticated way, whether it's rhythmically or tonally or even stylistically. Other, you know, They might like the way one person phrases it instead of another person. Totally. Uh, and so that's really what we're trying to do when we teach music. We're trying to change someone's internal uh, audiation perception or, or perception of music and just teaching names of things. Uh, this is the funny thing about teaching names is that the perception change has to have happened before the name helps. <laughs> yes. And that's you're labeling so, something that's already understood at some level. Like, oh, what yeah. kind of bird is that? Oh, you don't know the name of the bird? Well, knowing the name of the bird and what that bird is named in other countries and other languages and, and all this and recognizing the pattern that's on the bird like that tells us nothing about the bird. 
that you know oh what would tell us something about the bird you know there's so many um uh reasons that that bird turned out to be the way it is and of course there's a, the the beak of the finch is a wonderful uh book so easy to read that that goes beyond um you know darwin um if you ever see the beak of the finch it's a great great read um about how evolutionary very, um, theories evolved, uh, you know, post, you know, post Darwin. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. Our Darwinism it, yeah. evolved. Yeah. <laughs> Darwinism, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Darwinian. That's, that's fine. But that's great. Yeah. But that all ties back into, um, you know, anybody can appreciate anything without any understanding and that doesn't invalidate their appreciation of it. But, Sure. What we're obviously coming around to is once you get deeper into the meaning, and this is where audiation comes into, especially as you get up into, you know, you know, fourth and fifth stages uh, and sixth and how they match up with what happens in the music. Uh, that brings us to a deeper understanding and it, and it can only add to the appreciation the same way as, you know, Feynman would say, oh, okay, the size of that, stamen and the color of the flower mean something in nature and how it affected you know it's it's evolution to turn out the way it did mm -hmm. um so where we're headed is uh this extraordinary uh intersection of you know beauty and understanding together and what that means for our, um, you know, what does music mean in our daily lives? You know, is it just something to, you know, put on while you're doing the dishes? Is it something? I know? actually don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm very much influenced by Rand Blake on this, but I don't really listen to music anymore while I'm doing other tasks. I find it, um, I just don't find it enjoyable. I find I, I would prefer to have my attention... I, I'd rather like lay down and just full dive into the music or, or sit in a room. I, I don't listen to music while I'm at the gym or while I'm doing other things. I, I find don't. It's just, there's no reason now to have it just like as a background oh, It's noise. so funny. It, I don't either. I just don't. I, I put on, you know, podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also at my gym, there's very loud other music going on. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's yeah, that. Yeah. But, you know, it would almost be like, you know, I don't, when I'm doing the dishes, I don't have like fine artwork surrounding me and try to s grab glimpses of it, like in between looking at the dishes. It kind of feels the same. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to like put Stravinsky melodies in my mind, like just while I'm trying to distract myself from the dishes. Not, not that, you know, um, some kinds of music are very uh, enjoyable while you're doing certain activities. Like I actually really like snowboarding and listening to you know electric guitar music like instrumental like electric guitar music it's crazy uh -huh. like it just feels like listen to joe satriani while you're actually snowboarding is insane so if yeah. i'm not behind the keyboard <laughs> playing the tunes for the kids right and i put on a recording of something i'm fully involved in my movement and being expressive with the kids over the top so i can get the kids to express with me and that to me um is the time I'm really listening to the music and, and then, you know, and then watching the kids. It's so much more enjoyable. Um, and when my Mecca at the end of June, I always go to Saratoga Jazz Festival and that's where I get to be the, the three-year-old. You know, I just absorb the music mm -hmm. and just dance my full head off when, when I'm moved to, to do so. Um, so I'm fully engaged with music that way. And I, it's it's rare that I actually sit down and listen as much as I'd like to. Um, I it's just that when you're teaching six days a week uh, music, sure. my my ears want a break, and, the, and when they do get a break, it's because I want to compose something and to get away from the typical mm -hmm. music that I that I use in the classroom, um, which you know doesn't include you know some of my weird stuff here. <laughs> These are my weird choices now. And then these. Yeah, those, like, those are the 
those sounds. I'm, I'm, I'm I, and I'm trying to get away that. from <laughs> yeah. from traditional tonal stuff and harmonic stuff because because all they you know all I'm thinking about is what do the kids need next? You know, my my four year old class got a whole bunch of Phrygian because they pick. I said, pick a song and we'll do resting tone, you know, for twinkle or resting tone for uh, a minor song. And, and they and they they picked a song and I played it that way. And I was that right or wrong? I picked a song, I played it that way. It was right or wrong. And it's like somebody picked the song that's Phrygian. And I said, oh, that's not this one or that one. It's a new one. And then I just gave them like six uh, Phrygian <laughs> songs in a row. And they're just sitting there going, yeah, I recognize this. And they're not the same as the other. But, you know, yeah. it's like I just cut, you know, like they land into something that I latch on to. Um, so my I, I do actually really like taking breaks from certain types of music or certain aspects. Like if I'm doing a lot of tonal jazz and really working on that stuff, taking a couple of weeks or even like a month off and then coming back to it, it, it makes it sound more fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. The ears just kind of get sick of the same chord progressions all the time. I don't know how people play like one, five, six, four for every song. Like there's some <laughs> pop musicians, just like every song they play is that. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So if um, you know, we're we're talking about how there really is a difference between form and label, or knowing about something and what it can do and what it's all about in versus just knowing the name of it. And the, the question then is, is how do you teach this? You know, how do you actually make sure you're not just, because I don't think there's anything wrong with labels. They have a purpose for, in the human. I mean, language obviously is insanely powerful for the human race, but knowing, you know, concepts is also powerful and concepts gets a bad name because concept sounds like more labels, but in the technical term, um, you know, knowing something, math, for example, has a lot of concepts that if you don't understand, you know, what multiplication is, what addition is, what square roots are, those those are each types of concepts that you have to learn through experiences, through applying the operations. Um, that's where the knowledge of mathematics is. So like, you know, what is the air quote knowledge of music? It's It's things that are in your vocabulary, your musical vocabulary, and you have to learn those. This is like the big... Yeah. This is the big thing here. You, attach you your... have to learn them through experience. Basically, yeah, you... you have to listen to music. This, to is, why audio... <laughs> this is why oral, oral goes to verbal association. Oral, oral is this experience of it. And then verbal association helps solidify and anchor what you can already audiate with these names or, or the labels or the, just the verbal associates. So it can be names, labels, uh, or right, um, you know, uh, or syllables, uh, to h help anchor what it is that you can already audiate. If you don't do the oral, oral first, that that anchoring um, may, it, 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 it may not catch on unless a, a child has high enough aptitude or whatever. There's, What's there's funny, though, is we it. naturally, in a lot of teaching, we naturally do this. You know, once once kids learn how to count and they have basic number sense, we start showing them like, well, if I have two of these things and I add two more, then I have four of these things. We show them how addition works in very concrete, real world, simple examples. Only after they understand like two apples and then I gave you two more apples. We got four apples. You don't abstract out addition and show them what a plus sign means before they can do those simple operations, you know, with um, with actual physical concrete objects. And in the same way with music, you know, you don't abstract out the word major before someone's heard a lot of major songs and sung them. It does. It's just it's a meaningless term to give somebody. Yeah. Um on the other hand, I like giving kids access to things that they don't know. Like we learn resting tone do and resting tone la before I teach major and minor. I've said this before for sure, uh, because sure. it gives yeah. them access to, oh, there must be resting tone re and fa and so, because they know these things exist. You know, T, resting tone T, and they love to tease me with that. So uh, that's what I would say is like a very um, defensible theoretical generalization yeah. so what those students have done is they've said well there's resting tones law 
and dough. And this this guy keeps saying other things like fa and t and all these other. What if one of those was the resting tone? That is amazing. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we want people to do with theory. That, that's that's yeah. what theory is. It, it's a it's a plausible um, thing to experiment with. Yeah, yeah. It's something that you should you know it, it, it's not based on audiation at that point. In a way, it is, but it's not. Um, and. You know, they learn major, minor eventually, right? The, the terms that go with resting tone do and resting tone la. You know, we don't always call it that. that this is actually, you guys know these already. So this is so easy. We just say major and minor. It's easier. And then my favorite kids, or they're not my favorite kids, but the kids that help me understand them uh, better are the ones that say, well, what's the name for the one when we end here? <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not major or minor. They ask me, they're asking me for the names. And I say, oh, you're not ready for the names for all of them yet. And they say, yeah, they're begging for it. And so mm -hmm. I give them one or two, you know. And then the other thing I do, and this is going to throw a wrench into a little bit of what we're talking about. I think that naming something that they don't understand causes a void they need to fill in sometimes. And they understand well, that there's a direction that we're headed in towards understanding. So this is a, and this is a, uh, I don't use it very often, but I think it's valid that I create a void by say, oh yeah, we're going to learn, you know, uh, Phrygian, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I do this very often or very much at all. But we're gonna, I just like show them there's a lot we don't already know, like this, 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 and they, and then it's like, okay, this is, this is something we're gonna fill in later. Um, and this goes against what we've said so far. But the reason bit. I would say that what you're doing makes sense here is that you're introducing this new variable, this term that they don't actually understand while knowing how to actually teach them through the, to, through the music. through Exactly. The They've music. seen that I've so already brought them along. and they, What they, often happens, though, is someone doesn't know the distinction between those two, and they think that teaching the label is just going to magically lead to, to what? Yeah. You can't create a sensory experience out of nowhere. Music has to enter the ear you know, before it starts being it, taught. It gives them access to doing more generalization than I'm able to teach. Yeah. If it's if they're if they're able to generalize, that's better than me trying to keep them at verbal association or 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 oral, oral. I it's just I'm I'm trying to give them an expanded playground. Um more yeah. more place, more toys, more um slides, more that kind of stuff that they can go and investigate on their own. If they have it, I, if, if I only stayed in verbal association, I'm not giving kids the opportunity to, to do more inference learning. Uh, you, you know, even if they're not, maybe they're not even ready for the discrimination uh, learning, but, um, well, I wouldn't say that. Um, I, they're, I'm, I'm just giving them a, a huge step uh, to, to walk up if they want to, and they can find a way to get up there if, if they're um, if they're so dri yeah. driven and have enough um, you know vocabulary to, to work on that themselves. Who knows the, who the geniuses are in their class? You know, if you're not finding the geniuses, you know, I, I, this is one of the things. Um, music learning theory it's so great and works so brilliantly for kids um, that. You know, and all kids can become musical, right? And and but yet, what? I th and I th I think we've discussed this in an earlier episode. At some point, I are we holding some of the kids back from what's possible because we're stuck in you know this certain um, I, I, item in the learning sequence activities. I'm now teaching this one. And after I teach that one, I'm going to yeah. teach this one. I just like want us to be able to expand and then um, bridge up and back and up and back and dance with the, the aptitudes we have in front of us. That, that, well, I've talked about this, Eric, with the tonalities being arbitrary. You know, there's not really a reason that we should stop at seven plus harmonic minor. There's modes of harmonic minor, it's melodic minor, modes of melodic minor. Like I remember being 
I was 13 and in and playing songs with like Liddy and Flat Seven and Mixolydian and Flat Six. And I didn't have names for those, but like I knew those were different tonalities. Like I could I could tell that it wasn't, but I didn't have someone around me who was really guiding me. And so I think, you know, yeah, the aptitude helped me hear those on my own. But I still think if I had someone else who had been aware that those would have been good things to teach more of and give more examples of, that would have been great. And that's probably why I just kind of went off the deep end and just started listening to, you know, Stravinsky and all kinds of other stuff. Because where are you going to get those sounds from? Probably not your run-of-the-mill piano teacher is not going to be playing things that are really out there like that. But, uh, yeah, some of those things aren't accounted for in the sequence. Yep, yep. I, and who knows what experiences. So when I play some uh, woodwind quintet music and the harmonies are a little bit, you know, 20th century a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, who knows how much of that seeping in. Um, you know, and I I just feel like we don't have enough variety of that. We don't have enough really, truly expressive movement. We don't have enough different kinds of flowers <laughs> to show uh, the kids mm -hmm. so that, you know, if they have the, you know, and this is the, the key, is, you know, the um, intrinsic motivation. You know, some kids are just going to get there no matter what you teach them because they're intrinsically motivated like you you didn't know music learning theory but you got you taught yourself through the same principles because they're so natural it's just gordon yeah was I was, able to... I was talking to you about this before this is why i probably gravitate towards gordon is because i had validated a lot of the stuff he spoke about when i was young i i realized that when i learned stuff by ear and then played it it sounded it, way better than the people i hung out with that learned stuff from reading notation like it wasn't even comparable like it was so obvious to me that <laughs> he yeah he brought he brought distinctions to that which we had experience in but didn't understand and the, in those distinctions like once you know color then colors you don't understand color without you don't understand any individual colors without color being like that you know what i mean like you want to hear something interesting about color I, i've I apologize. I forget what book I read this in, but it was some kind of neuroscience book or linguistics book. It might have been Steven Pinker, but the first two colors in any language that get a name are red or sorry, are, are white and black. And the third color is always red yeah. every time. And then it's blue and uh, sorry, then I think it's green and yellow or blue and yellow. But it's interesting. There's, there's a like kind of a there's a sequence to color naming that that cultures go through. And some of them have an uh, an uh a choice between two for the next step but it, it's it's interesting it's always i'm wondering with red though is it's because our blood's red is it always the third <laughs> like hey that, that you know that, like someone could be dying it, when, yeah when when we well, see this color people die well like, <laughs> there's an emotional listen there's an emotional <laughs> attachment you know so black and white you know in utero you're you're experiencing shades of of that right mm -hmm. and uh and then so once you're born you know your eyes uh i i you know i i, I don't know so i'm not <laughs> gonna go there but i am gonna say that the emotional attachment uh helps us yeah. remember and so if they're you know you're born into a, a red puddle so the emotional attachment uh, you know to, to bring this out of color and into music one of the reasons i really like the the exercise that Rand blake in his book, Primus of the Ear Gives, that we've talked about a lot on this podcast about making a playlist and listening to this playlist twice a day. And we're not talking about five minute songs, just like one minute sections of songs. I think the emotional connection of the, um, the your, your audition is changed after listening to these songs for a month. You know, you'd go through oral, oral, and you sing them and all that kind of stuff. My street version of oral, oral, my lowercase MLT, oral, oral. But there's an emotional connection that's made because the song has a name and there's a certain artist that plays the song. I do think um, that that plays a role in how it augments someone's memory rather than just learning a bunch of exercises out of like a unmarked book. Like, for example, I've noticed when when I teach kids songs from movies that they have a strong connection with, 
the patterns in those songs are just grilled into their memory. You know, if I go bomb, 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 you know, some of these, uh, or, or one of my students, her, that little sound, dun, 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 that's her doorbell at home. Yeah. That tonal pattern was very easy to teach her because I was yep. like, that's your doorbell. So there's some kind of emotional connection that can be leveraged when, you know, music it means something to somebody, you know, from whether it's a show they like or a band that they like. But yeah, that's um, yeah, funny how that uh, how that works. Yeah. Did we t ever Maybe talk about teaching like the concept of like what? So go going back to like a, a deeper context of this. Do you ever explain the concept of audiation? I think we, we did touch on this before. So we touched that... on this a little bit. Yeah. But I think it's really important once you know your students can audiate and maybe they're not improvising, but if someone's improvising, you definitely, I think, should be explaining this because if you're an MLT teacher and you're not explaining how audiation works and how the skill learning sequence works, no one else is going to show it to them. I mean, it's very rare. I think they're going to have more than one MLT kind of person in their life. But most of my, as I said on another episode, most of my high school students um, who have been with me for a couple of years, they can tell you the skill learning sequence, not in Gordwinian terms, but they know that if you can't, if you're not listening to it and you can't sing it and you can't hear it in your head silently, you're not learning it correctly. Yeah. And so I think it's, and they know that it's, it follows similar conventions as language. They know there's this vocabulary component, you know, they, they can't explain it in terms of the way learning sequences yeah. music. They're not going to talk to you about musical perception and the stages of audiation and all this stuff, but they know it's vocabulary. They're starting to understand the inner workings of the system that gives rise to audiation and why we're working the way we are. Same way it, you know, it gives somebody the opportunity to look beyond the beauty of the flower and get into the inner workings of why nature had it had it uh, evolved that the way that it did, attract exactly. those bugs that it did, and like that. So there's some glue, uh, like the background noise gets glued uh, to the to the thing itself that you're trying to understand. That that there's I had some a great deep, conversation. Deep level. Some I had a great conversation yeah. yesterday with one of my students, and he's been with me for this is the fourth year he's been he's been with me, and he he has a playlist on iTunes that I have access to, so I know all the songs that he listens to. And I said, you know what? It's so great you have a playlist because like there's like a hundred songs on here that I know are just burned into your mind, and this is so fun for us to learn from these songs, and you know it, it actually just helps you learn music better. And I said, you know, it's surprising, but a lot of students don't listen to music on their own time. It's very common and in especially instrumental instruction. And, you know, I kind of pushed him to answer, like, why is that a problem for learning to learning music? And he said, no, immediately. And this isn't this is uncoached, unprompt, um, unprompted by me now. He, he starts saying things like, well, how would a kid if they grew up in an English speaking household just spontaneously learn to speak Spanish if no one in their house was speaking Spanish to them? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like he understands, yep. you know, that you need input. You need grist for the this, mill. <laughs> this week, we're going to look at the daffodil. And then next week, we'll look at a tulip. And then we'll learn the name of the tulip. And and then and then we'll, you know, no, get, sh show them a whole field of wildflowers. And, and just go to the flower and store go, and just and, dive in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, and then, you know, so there's, there's like the, Right, the listening vocabulary, and then you start to get to the point where you can actually write a paper describing, you know, and then you're a botanist at some point, right, mm -hmm. where you're really deep into it. And does that take away any of the beauty that we're already experiencing with, uh, um, you know, with whatever you're engaged in? And it's such, it's. I, it just occurred to me, you know, when I sent you that article that there's some overlay here. And this is uh, Richard Feynman is just because he's so funny. Uh, he's so easy to uh, he's so well spoken. He can explain things in very, very simple terms. Uh, that is the Feynman technique. Yeah. So, you know, his technique for learning. Can you explain how something works? No jargon in your own words. If you can't do that, then it's highly unlikely you understand anything because 
you're kind of faking it by using labels, just the way someone can fake playing something on the piano by memorizing pitch letters and the order that something. I can't tell you the number of dissertations I've read that I that I it it's it's insane. They they mean they're meaningless. They're just meaningless. Yeah, but that exercise is actually really good as a studying tool because you're practicing a recall, but you're actually practicing, you know, just how does this conceptually work? No jargon, no fanciness, you know? And it, I think it's good we have things like learning sequences in music where things are very granular and precise, but it also helps to learn. That's why, you know, this podcast exists and, and you know, there's a lot of other great MLT podcasts starting to come out. But it's good to hear this stuff explained in everyday language, not, you know, the most analytical, precise language possible. Sometimes, you know, you need to just hear something. Well, we listen to music. We kind of have something that's like vocabulary changes the way you hear. And eventually you can kind of speak the language of music and improvise. I think it's useful to have a simple framework like that to yeah. hang your hat on. Yeah, uh, it is pretty esoteric at some level. and. Hard to, which I very and, much love. <laughs> which is, yeah, but it's hard to penetrate for people. And that's why Eric Bluestein's book is so valuable in understanding music learning theory for people that don't, uh, you know, want to start with a, a brick wall to chip through, which learning sequences and music is often is for people. It can be very hard because to, to, to understand the totality of it, so many insights have to be online at the same time. It's a total kind of yeah. systematic understanding. Yeah. and you know, one concept can give you issues. Yes. Like, and that that is why I think I've talked to you about this before. If you can't already audiate to a reasonable degree and you're trying to read learning sequences on your own, you won't have enough kind of internal awareness of what's yeah. going on to even yeah. make it through the book. So the explanation yeah. of why the stamen is the way it is down to the cellular level and, and beyond and the, and the growth rate and the climate that it lives in and the bees and the and animals that help make it uh thrive versus somewhere else um this is what music learning theory is and uh it it, it never fails to open up a new uh door for me in terms of how i'm you know applying my teaching uh, you know applying the one the, one of the most amazing things in terms of using this style or method or framework of teaching not a method but yeah where i'm going with this is watching how people rhythmically respond to this like you know i teach drums and piano and it's funny to watch students <laughs> if you're talking about one beat macro beat pattern so like due to data or due day in, in duple um it's funny how people will just spontaneously exchange them you know they're playing they're playing a song and it should be due day due day and the kid just randomly plays do to data and they don't even know that they did it. Like, so there's yep. something perceptually going on. The brain knows it can exchange one, one beat micro, uh, macro beat pattern for another. And the kid has no idea what they just did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a two year old <laughs> today or not today, this week that I was doing just ba ba ba, And then I did ba 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 you know, and this kid just hammered out something. He didn't know he, what he did, and oh my god, I was I just was floored. I wish I had it on recording because you just never know. It's completely it's very weird about this the subconscious aspect of of the way the tonal patterns and rhythm patterns work. Like you just give them to people, they copy them, and then but they start percolating down into their psyche and they start using them randomly without even knowing it. <laughs> oh, I I do the most ridiculous. Uh, Rhythm patterns, after we've done rhythm patterns for maybe a minute, minute and a half, that's the most I do with these three-year-olds. And we're just, uh, we start jamming. Sometimes the the staff at the daycare center gets gets involved too, and it just turns into this little jam for a little bit. And then you stop, and, and the kids, um, once in a while, will be just on that, on that slide down the hill, and they just... Um, surprise you uh, and that stuff is is gold um it tells you yeah. it tells you that you know they're on board but uh um, yeah it's a lot of fun so we need more more flowers more understanding of why the flower is Feynman I just I, I he's I, he's a really interesting guy yeah yeah, yeah. so um uh, oh 
hope this was valuable. I, I enjoy these kinds of conversations, intersections of like, you know, what is, <laughs> this is out there, but yeah, like, what is the intersection of, of like, <laughs> of, um, uh, what did I say earlier? We were talking offline. Physics and music. Theoretical, the, what, physics, theoretical and music. physics and oh, Charlie Parker. And Charlie Parker. <laughs> Well, my answer was that there's an insight about how the brain learns and organizes information that that shows up in many different fields, like I was saying, in philosophy and religion, in uh, music and theoretical physics, in math, in 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 mathematics, like how people learn mathematics. It's the same insight that shows up everywhere. This is, and I feel like once you understand this, and maybe it's maybe the first time you get this insight is through Gordon, you deal with other kinds of learning in a different way. You know, I have, a, I have a friend who's a high school, who's a elementary math teacher, and I was helping him make um, uh, some math lessons. And I'm not a math teacher, but you know that the concepts have to be learned from sensory experience first. You know there has to be practical examples. Yep. Yep. You know you can't teach through abstraction first. Abstraction's a type of generalization. Yep. And the, you know the guy's like, "How do you know this? You're not a math teacher. Like you, you don't have a teaching. It's just it's obvious once you understand this stuff because you can't teach someone." <laughs> something from nothing <laughs> nope but it's fascinating yeah i find it really interesting okay i think that's i think that's good for today yeah i that's that's a good uh good swipe at that we, might... we kept it under an hour holy smoke <laughs> <laughs> 40 40 minutes or something all right yeah. cool all right next time